so this is Digital Music Trends, a coverage of uh, South by Southwest 2013, and I'm here with Scott Perry from uh, Sperry Media. So hi Scott, and how's it going today? Fantastic, how about yourself? Great, thank you. Yeah, so uh, let's talk about uh, Sperry Media first. You guys just celebrated your 11th uh, anniversary, uh, so it's quite a landmark for a company that works in this space. And uh, how do you guys start out, and what do you guys do? Yeah, um, Sperry Media does uh, marketing promotions, consulting for uh, film studios, TV networks, record labels, and tech startups in the LA area. And uh, my passion's always been in the music industry. And what I've been trying to do for the past few years is to um, educate and move uh, bands and labels into emerging uh, technology platforms in a way that isn't disruptive to their current processes and helps them um, ease into the space without taking on too many additional responsibilities as these new platforms emerge. You know, whether it's MySpace, Facebook, Tumblr, Pinterest, uh, uh, Twitter, Instagram, Cinemagram, Viddy, uh, whatever it may be, yeah. you know, there's a time to like, you know, at least establish your name early on and claim your name before it gets big. Yeah. But then after a while, you kind of have to wait to see what happens where and where the audience is going to go with it before you devote yourself full time to those spaces. So I help uh, a lot of my clients navigate that without having to you know like take on too much too soon yeah of course and uh, of course when you started probably myspace was a big thing to to look after uh, and so all, that must have evolved incredibly since then and it's really coming into its own now with uh, services like instapaper uh, sorry um, instagram and uh, pinterest and and all that that exactly. rider thing and there's uh, your turn as well that just came out that that yeah. kind of rides on that yeah your turn just came out i got a beta invitation like i think at the end of last week so i haven't had time to download it and test it to see how it works because obviously i've been here for all this yeah sure but i'm in, i'm in encouraged by what we can do with um, with, with images and um, how we can use that to communicate with fans without overwhelming them with too much stuff. And the best thing about like uh, the new the new trends in social visual, um, whether it be uh, Pinterest, Tumblr, Instagram, Cinemagram, yeah. and now your turn is like basically we can use images to communicate with uh, using minimal words, which is great because you're like overcoming language barriers, um, or people are a lot more responsive to images, and so as such we have to empower those images with the tools for better communication, sharing, and more importantly, commerce. Yeah. Um, yeah. So basically, I mean, if I'm not mistaken, it's your turn. Like, actually, have buttons where you can um, link out to purchase stuff. Uh, you can integrate all sorts of things into it, like it's kind of a drag, drag and drop interface. So there's a lot of stuff you can do. With yeah, there's going to be a lot of that moving forward, where a lot of people are like taking images and placing pins on top of them, where you can add links to other stuff. Yeah. And that's a very exciting trend. Who's going to win that space? It's the where like not even the game hasn't even started yet, yeah. Yeah. but. Um, we're going to see a lot of that going on in the next 18 months where the image itself has already been a primary tool for communication, but now it's going to be delivering a lot more links and messages to yeah. other things, whether it's commerce, whether it's articles, whether it's music videos, and people can share those images and inside the image itself are multiple links to multiple properties that expand the story people want to go to it. Well, they can just look at a pretty picture and just be happy with that. So. Yeah, sure. And, and of course, um, uh, you talk about visual hashtags and uh, you wrote a white paper that I would recommend everyone to go and download. I'll put a link up in the show notes uh, of this video. And um, uh, you talk about visual hashtags visual hashtag, which is a, an interesting concept because, of course, people think of hashtags as just a piece of text. Yeah. And, and so how do, you, how do you define a visual ha hashtag in a way that it's searchable uh, uh, as far as metadata and everything else goes? Well, the thing is, I mean, the music industry has totally missed the boat on hashtags. I mean, they've been misunderstood or they've been used primarily as a short-term trending topic in a way to gather audiences, especially around TV shows and events and sporting events and whatnot. Yeah. But the music industry itself has not used hashtags uh, to their fullest potential to bring audiences together to share those experiences, to find content under a common search term uh, within the social space, and then uh, have a means of archiving, curating, repurposing that content. Um, say, for instance, you know, Madonna will play a show, 20,000 people a night. You know, people will post all these pictures, but she has no immediate access to that stuff. I mean, Facebook is a closed environment, so hashtags don't work. Twitter, well, that's great, but if you don't establish a hashtag, then how are you going to know how to tag it or post it? Um, Instagram, it's hashtag-based. But at the same time, not only do you have to, like, collect all this stuff, you have to figure out what to do with it, but then respect the rights of the people that took the pictures. I yeah. mean, you have, you know, the person who took the picture owns the rights of the picture. Um, if you took a picture of somebody else and you have model release, but then again, if you're at a concert, if you're at an event, I mean, you're kind of there to see that show. So at some point, yeah. the artist or entity putting on that event should have some rights to use that for promotional, maybe commercial purposes. But we need to establish those um, those guidelines in order to allow that happen that respects the person that took the picture, that respects the person that's in the picture, but also respects the, the, the people that put on the show itself. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
And that, that's kind of a, an interesting and, and in a way controversial like uh, thought of uh, who owns the copyright of those pictures. Of course, you know the the law would say that the pictures are owned by the person that, that takes them. Uh, on the other hand, you know there are so many disclosures at the back of the tickets these days that uh, it would be feasible to to think that at some point they would add a, a disclosure whereby any picture that you made public on, on online that where of that concert then could be used uh, as well uh, I mean, by the artist. There, there should be some basic language within a show that says, you know, any um, any images, any stellar moving images taken during this event um, become the shared property of, you know, promoter, venue, owner, manager, label, artist, uh, in perpetuity across all uh, across all formats in the universe, whatever the legal term terminology is. But what's even crazier is like what I've been focusing on right now is all this 1.0 stuff where it's like you take a picture, you manually tag it so that at some yeah. point we've got a database that's large enough they can do smart tagging automatically. I mean, your phone can tell you when you took the picture. Your phone can tell you where you took the picture, and that's already embedded into the metadata within the picture itself. But there's still stuff that needs to be associated with that for other, you know, for other search functionality. Yeah. What's happening is you're getting a lot of location-based services like Banjo right now that can actually pull up images based on geo, based on events, um, automatically. So like you just pull up the Banjo app and boom, all of a sudden you can see all the pictures from last night's Alicia Keys concert across multiple platforms. Um, you can see pictures from last night's uh, you know, basketball games you know, uh, across multiple platforms. It's, it's going to be a great tool moving forward. Um, I just got introduced to the new version of Banjo last night, so I'm going to dig into that to see where it goes and how to make the use of that. But again, the game hasn't even begun. Yeah. Yeah, but all of a sudden, it's like you've got a, a way of um, embedding links into pictures to create more commerce capability across, you know, when things are shared with friends, but then you also have location-based apps that can pull pictures across multiple platforms that are tagged with the time and the place. So yeah. you might not even have to go through the whole process of tagging it in the future, but right now, we don't even have that, and we need those kind of things. Yeah, of course, and, and now one of the challenges is that, of course, a service like, like Banjo uh, it is a third, you know, third-party service, and the problem, I guess, is that for mainstream users to actually start enjoying uh, seeing everything together, or you know, an event or anything like that, you would need a major service to actually introduce that as as a feature within, within their app. I mean, I, I don't know whether a third party is going to really take off on the mainstream. What's, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I mean, basically, it's like if, if somebody's built an app that's made my life easier to enjoy an experience or enhance an experience, like if I'm not at last night's Matchbox 20 show, uh, you know, I'd like to see what's going on um, if I were a fan of the band. Um, you know, if I were, uh, we're not at Alicia Keys' concert, I'd want to see what's going on. If I were in Alicia Keys' camp, I'd want a means of collecting all those images without having to do a manual scrape across all these platforms. So, you know, if, uh, if, if Banjo can build out like some type of a back-end tool where people can plug in um, plug into their API and pull those images and surface them on their website to show what happened at last night's concert, that's great. Yeah, yeah. But you also have to strike a balance between people um, enjoying the show, you know, without like holding up their phone the entire time, you yeah. know, and you kind of, I mean, you want to encourage some of it for sharing, but not so much of it to where it becomes a distraction to yeah. the to the performer. Of course. And um, you know, even you know, the reason why I bring up Matchbox 20 is because uh, their manager just launched this whole panoramic tool where they set up three cameras at a show in Virginia last night where they're doing like, um, panoramic views um, across the venue so that if you're not at that show their fan base can watch you know parts of that show online as it's happening wow. um, you know they've got a very passionate fan base so it's yeah, good that's awesome and so you were talking uh, briefly about you know the bridging uh, connecting the, the part whereby everybody is sharing these uh, images and videos and stuff to bridging it to some sort of commercial uh, commercial level so how do you think that's the best way to do it? is that with overlays uh, trying to connect uh, with widgets uh, getting people to buy stuff from from the media that is put out there? You know, I mean, overlays are going to be a great way because all of a sudden you have commerce opportunities that are a lot more implied and not uh, direct. Like, I mean, right now, whenever you post something on Facebook, it's like, yeah, here's a picture of the band, share this picture, like this picture, and all this. It's like, you know, I mean, you're going to do that to game the system for their, you know, edge rank algorithm. So the more shares and likes you get, the more it spreads across the fan base, which I think is complete bullshit. I mean, if you've got 10 million followers, 10 million followers should see your pictures. If you're not putting out interesting stuff, then fine, you deserve to lose those fans. But it's not for Facebook to decide yeah. you know, as a creator. Now, if you're if you're a brand like Oldsmobile and you're like just doing pictures that are disguised as ads, then no, I'm going to drop you. But if I'm a fan of a band, I want to see what they're posting. I don't want my social network you know, uh, putting a, a guard up of it because yeah. I'm not as engaged with them as much as I should be. As a marketing guy, I follow a lot of bands. 
I do not engage with bands. I'm following them for marketing purposes. But because I'm not engaged with them, sharing, liking, or whatever it is they want, uh, they drop out of my stream immediately. Yeah. Um, and so I think that yeah, Facebook acting as a gatekeeper for people that are creating legitimate content that fuels their traffic is really hurting them more than it is the bands. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I mean, have, but you know, long story short, having a means of overlaying commerce opportunities without having to beg for that sale is going to make a big difference. Um, you know, same thing with YouTube. I mean, like YouTube's great when you can get, you know, I think it's like, what, $5,000 in, in, in ad, a shared ad revenue um, per million views, which is awesome. Uh, and of course, YouTube is the number one platform right now for, for music consumption. But, you know, at those levels, I mean, you're talking about maybe half a cent per viewer, per view, whatever it may be. Um, and we need to up that. So hopefully, um, I haven't talked directly to anybody at YouTube, but hopefully they're making a more robust system to where publishers, um, creators can have more obvious um, commerce opportunities within the ecosystem. I mean, like right now you find a video on YouTube uh, on your browser, there are links to purchase stuff below the, uh, below the video. If you're watching it on your phone, then all of a sudden you have to click the little I button for information and hope that you can find stuff. And when you do find it, you hope that the commerce um, link is actually enabled for mobile purchasing, which most of them are not. They're you know, more robust sites that are best viewed on a desktop browser. Um, and that's something we have to change because people are realizing ad revenue is nice, publishing revenue is nice, but merchandise revenue is much nicer. And so anything you can do, whether it's like selling you know, t-shirts directly to fans, posters, um, or even just getting affiliate revenue with Amazon links beyond that, it's awesome. And I think bands are starting to learn now, it's like, okay, so you, 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 you release a song, that's nice, but your product manager needs to be uh, creating a merch offering with that video yeah. because your most of your views are going to come in the first two weeks so if you get a million views in two weeks and then all of a sudden you offer a t-shirt on the third week when people aren't watching it as much you've lost that opportunity to sell to those people when the excitement's brand new um, and I think people are starting to learn that I'm, I'm evangelizing it with all the labels right now it's like you know when you do a, a, a video at least make a lithograph a t-shirt something simple and affordable that people are like oh wow I like that video I want to buy that right now because it's 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 one thing to get you know your 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 you know whatever it is you get off of a off of an Amazon or an iTunes um, you know whatever revenue you get off of that uh, but it's something altogether when you can get the lion's share of the merchandise revenue when you're yeah. selling a twenty dollar piece instead of a ninety nine cent piece so. yeah, and of course like Top Spin uh, have integrated with uh, with YouTube to offer some of the merchandise on there I haven't heard any numbers as to how some of the I campaigns know. went uh, so I, I don't know really how how that I, how I have not heard myself I have no idea I've got to check with those guys and see what kind of success rate they've had. Um, I do like the fact they've like pushed the envelope a little bit to get those merch offerings closer to the entertainment offering, but I have not seen any articles or um, uh, press the guys internally to ask them exactly what type of success rates they had. So it's so yeah. crucial to get more merch revenue on top of you know digital sales. Yeah, sure. And, and how do you recommend you know your uh, clients? Well, what do you recommend your clients when, uh, if and when something like, for example, Bowers uh, Harlem Shake happens, and you know he made the choice, like Sai, to allow for people to do whatever they wanted with the track and he still gets all the publishing revenues from and you know some affiliate from from having the track on, on the videos uh, which probably makes him more money than his his you know oh, totally, his own video totally. uh, so h how would you recommend people deal with that uh, maybe if, if, they, if they're not so uh, on board with the fact that other people are appropriating their content you know that's a high-level decision that I've uh, I've had no input in with any of the gatekeepers associated with any of that stuff but obviously what's happening now is um, there is a whole ecosystem being built around uh, covers and you know like uh, there's an article on the Wall Street Journal about a month ago that showed the new Maroon 5 video had 5 million views of the Maroon 5 video but then the aggregate numbers of views that they had for the um, for the cover were 4.9 million so all of a sudden you know it's like as, as the creator you know Maroon 5 can go in and claim those you know claim that traffic claim that advertising money, but also claim the publishing on the publishing side. Now, because the covers, the label doesn't get that because the label owns the master only, but the publisher can come in and claim the money for that, for, for the performances. And so what's happening now is you have companies like Universal Music Publishing partnering with um, a company called Maker Studios in order to um, 
uh, uh, enhance the number of views, boost the number of views of these cover versions, promote the number of views so that it generates more advertising and publishing revenue for them. Wow, that's great. And uh, just to finish, you know, uh, any campaign that you, you've been working on recently that you're particularly excited about or you've done something that it's a bit uh, different with? Um, I guess more than anything, I'm happy with some stuff I did for the uh, the new Kevin Bacon show, The Following on Fox, because um, yeah, it, it brought together the online space with the real world space. I did a lot of outreach to comic book and sci-fi fans across America, yeah. and I think that's crucial. I mean, like, it's really easy for us to buy ads across entire networks and verticals. It's very easy for larger companies to do a site takeover the week of a movie release or anything like that. Um, and what people tend to forget is there needs to be a human element to drive it home and to make it real. And in the music industry, we're fortunate with that because that, that live thing, that, that, that real life event is usually the concert itself. Yeah. And that's good. But we also need to realize that that is like, it's not just an artist performing for uh, an audience. It is an artist bringing together a community of like-minded people who enjoy that experience and you want to like take that concert experience, take that connection experience and extend it into the online space to where it's more than just, yo, know, hey man, buy my stuff, hey man, buy my stuff, hey man, buy my stuff. Yeah. So. Of course. Well, it was a pleasure having you on your show. Uh, it's uh, uh, sparrymedia.com and I'm going to put the links in the show notes to that white paper on digitalmusic.org. Thanks so much for coming on. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. Thank you.